Let's see if you can help me out here. I gave you a head start. We start here. And like before, you're like, okay, this inverse trig stuff, I don't know anything going on here, so I need to get back into regular trigonometry land. But just like with tan inverse, in fact, all the inverse trig functions, there's a restriction. What's our restriction? I've actually kind of drawn it for you over here, right? It's conveniently exactly the same restriction that you noted before. Okay, so, so far, so good. And here it is, by the way, here's my representation of it. I've got negative pi on 2 all the way down here. Negative pi on 2. And then I've got positive pi on 2 up here. So here's our range restriction because we don't want this thing wiggling around forever. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a function, so we won't be in inverse trig functions. Okay, so this is good. Now what? Where did you go next? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I can take the derivative with respect to y on both sides, right? And it's like, huh, what was the big deal? I thought you said tan was easier, right? This is super simple, right? You're like, this doesn't look that difficult. That's a good step, right? But at this point, like in our tan proof, right? Our tan inverse proof, I should say. At this point, we had to pull out an identity to get us from sec land into tan land. Now, there's something similar that we can pull here, and you've already used this identity today to get us from cos land back into sine land. What's the identity that's probably going to be most helpful here? Now, we've actually got two choices, don't we? Um, and I did say we used it before. We used both of them today. One of them is the complement identity, right? So cos y would be equal to sine of 90, or in our context, we're doing calculus, right? Pi on 2, take away y. I might just jot that down over here in another color for a second. Now, this is a good candidate because, well, we're in signs. Thumbs up, okay? The reason why I don't like it, though, so much is that I've gotten from cosines into sines, but see this thing? This angle in here, it's like further away from this. This is really hard to mess about with, right? So even though it is true, and I've like solved one half of the problem, I haven't solved the other one. I've actually made the other half harder to solve. And that doesn't mean this is wrong. It just means, okay, we found a dead end, no problem. What's another path? What's another identity we've used today that connects sine and cosine? We used it when we were doing this one, do you remember? It's the, it's the Pythagorean identity, right? It's sine squared, sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, okay? Now, this is even better. We don't even need to divide through by cos squared to get sec squared and so on, right? But, and this is why I left the sine inverse proof to later, um, and we did the tan inverse one first. What's the problem with this? You can't use this out of the box either. Anyone notice what the issue is? Like, I want cos y equals a thing, right? There's, there's why I've got to substitute, right? Now, cos y is hiding there. We can kind of unbury it, right? Let's rearrange just a little bit. If I subtracted sine squared from both sides, right? I'd get 1 minus sine squared. That, that, that looks good. That looks promising. I've got cos squared here. I want cos y. So what should I do? I should take the square root. Now, on the left-hand side, Everything looks great. On the right hand side, you take the square root, 1 minus sine squared, but there's something missing. What's missing? Plus minus. Plus minus? Oh no, plus minus. Okay. When you take the square root of both sides, there are obviously two solutions, right? x squared equals 25. Positive 5 works, negative 5 also works just as well. So in this case here, I have to deal with the fact that in fact, cos can be negative sometimes, right? Cos can be positive sometimes, and that would give you the square root, no problem. But cos can also be negative, so I have to include this plus minus just while doing this. Now this is a problem, we can get out of it. Do you have a question or a suggestion as to how to get out of it? Okay, so this is, our, this is our way to get out of it, right? This is just true in and of itself when you're just dealing with the identity, right? But 
up here on our second line, we notice that we don't want sine inverse and cos inverse everywhere. We only want it in this, this little spot, right? Uh, in this little spot, and I've drawn this, which you may like to draw right now, because it's actually very helpful to know why we're about to do what we're doing. This is the cos graph. I'm going to call this as y and cos y. I know it's a little bit weird putting y on the horizontal axis, but this is all in terms of y's. Right? So that's our independent variable, as it were. Okay? This is y cos y. What's this value here? What's that intercept? It's pi on 2. And what about this intercept over here? Negative. It's negative pi on 2. So because of my range restriction over here, even though cos sometimes is positive, sometimes is negative, I'm only interested in this section in here. Do you see that? So I can actually just forget that the rest of it exists. Just don't worry about it, right? This is the only part I care about, right? Now in this zone, in this range, cos y does not, can never be negative blah 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 blah, right? Because, well look, it's literally never negative. So therefore I can say, wrong color, but I'm going to invoke my restriction here, negative pi on 2 to pi on 2. Because this is true, cos y equals the positive square root only, okay? Please never just get rid of a plus or a minus just because it's convenient, even though it would be convenient. You have to have a reason to just like ditch a whole answer, okay? And this is our reason why. Does this make sense? If that's still a bit fuzzy to you, come back and ask me after we're done here. We are almost done, but um, it is a really important step that you can't skip over. And we didn't have to do it with tan, that's why I did tan first and sine second. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the substitution. So here it is. This is going to go all the way up into there. Instead of cos y, I'm going to write the square root of 1 minus sine squared. So I need a bit more square space over here. Square root of 1 minus sine squared, like so. I can do a substitution now, can't I? I can get back into x land. What am I going to write here? I'll have the square root already, and then 1 minus x squared. There it is, right there. Okay, 1 minus x squared. Now this is dx on dy. We've gotten back into x's. At this point, what did I have to do? Take the reciprocal. dy on dx equals 1 over that thing. Ta-da. Just like before where it's like, oh, we've got an algebraic result, we've got another algebraic result here. It is a bit weirder and messier than with tan inverse. There's no square root here because we never had to invoke a square root to use the identity. Here we did have to. That's kind of why I was dwelling on it and didn't just skip over it. There's a square root in sign because of this stuff over here. Okay.